Welcome, my name is Pastor Scotty Bockhaus, and we thank you for taking some time to listen to some audio recordings from the pulpit of the Riverview Baptist Church. Our desire is to show the Lord high, holy, and lift it up, as well as try to be a blessing to those through the Word of God. Please enjoy this message, and we pray that it will be a blessing to your life. And if you wouldn't mind, would you take your copy of the Word of God and turn with me to the Old Testament book of Jeremiah. The Old Testament book of Jeremiah and Jeremiah in chapter number 18. The book of Jeremiah and chapter number 18. As we're finishing up the year, we're hitting a couple different messages that I believe the Lord is directing from His Word to help us. We believe that the Riverview Baptist Church is right on the cusp of some wonderful things happening. And in order for those things to happen, God has to set some things in order, and He's doing a work. And sometimes people are confused with that work. That sometimes people say, all right, Lord, I'm surrendered. What do you want me to do? And instead of immediately the light shining down, the chorus of angels, you start to have more troubles. And things start not working right. And things start falling apart. And they go, well, what, what's going on? How come this is happening? I surrendered. Why is these things happening? Well, if you don't mind, I'd like to explain to you from the Word of God to open up some eyes to give encouragement about what's going on that you can see what's going on and make the preparation. God is clearly doing a work and we're just right on the edge of some wonderful things. And I believe that this is the right message for the right time for the right people to be an encouragement, to be a help, to help us to move forward. So if you wouldn't mind to take your copy of the Word of God and turn with me to the Old Testament book of Jeremiah. The Old Testament book of Jeremiah in Jeremiah chapter 18. The gospel or the book of Jeremiah chapter 18 notice with me starting at verse 1. The book of Jeremiah chapter 18 and verse 1, the Bible says this. The word which came to Jeremiah from the Lord is saying, Arise and go down to the potter's house, and there I will cause thee to hear my words. Then I went down to the potter's house, and behold, he wrought a work on the wheels. And the vessel that he made of clay was marred in the hand of the potter, so he made it again, another vessel, as it seemed good to the potter to make it. Then the word of the Lord came to me saying, O house of Israel, can I not do with you as this potter? Saith the Lord, behold, as the clay is in the potter's hand, so are ye in my hand, O house Israel. Of Israel. And if you have it marking things in your Bible, would you mark a phrase that we find in Jeremiah chapter 18? Jeremiah chapter 18, and notice with me in verse 6, as God says, The clay is in the potter's hand. The clay is in the potter's hand. And if you would allow me to rework the title, and I would like to title this Broken and Remade. Broken and Remade remade. If you wouldn't mind, let's go to the Lord together and let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much again for you being a wonderful God. And as we come to you now, we're just asking that you would just help give us direction, give us grace, open up the Bible in a special way, and that you would encourage these good folks to this special message. Lord, I dare not trust my own. So I ask that Everything that I am, my thoughts, my ambitions, my goals, what I want to see done, I surrender and give that to you. That you get accomplished what you want to get done through your word, through this message, through this illustration. And that you would truly help this church to move forward in a special way because of it. Lord, I'm asking that we would be fully surrendered and fully in your hand on the potter's wheel. Lord, thank you that we could trust you in Jesus' name. Amen. Good. In this passage, Jeremiah is brought by the Lord to a potter's house. A potter is someone who would actually make pots and pl out of clay. He'd make little vessels, whether it was big jars or cups or plates. He would be there making the clay, which was very important in the ancient world. As Jeremiah was watching the clay, he watched as 
a vessel was being made and the vessel was marred. What does it mean to be marred? It's when it collapses in itself. Something happens and the clay just kind of gets lopsided and just... And so Jeremiah watches it and then the whole thing gets collapsed over. And then he watches as the, the potter takes that clay and he remakes it into a different vessel, into another vessel that was good to the potter. Now the primary interpretation that God is giving is to Jeremiah's dealing with the nation of Israel. Remember that Jeremiah has been preaching for 40 years and this is in the early part of his ministry where he's trying to warn the people, get right with God, get right with God, get right with God, get right with God, get right with God because destruction is coming. And destruction did come when the Babylonians invaded and destroyed the southern kingdom kingdom of Judah in 586 BC. But God said, give some warning. But at the same time, he says, I'm doing a work. Stay on the wheel. I am going to remake. I haven't forgotten about my people Israel. I'm still working on them. I still have a plan. I still have something. And so in the midst of this, when the whole thing collapses together and Israel is destroyed, God says, don't worry about it. I've still got a plan. I'm still planning on using this clay. I still want to make a vessel out of it. I still have something in hand. Now that was the direct interpretation was to encourage the people there. However, we could also see that it applies to us as individuals too. That we could see here as Jeremiah is watching that we're seeing that God is working. Now, when the clay becomes too dry or it's not to be moldable or will not be mold in the potter's hand, that what happens is that clay gets set aside. By the way, that was Paul's greatest fear was to be cast away. What does it mean to be cast away? It means to be set aside no longer for use. For example, let's say that um, you have an old TV. I meant one of those old uh, tube TVs. And so, you don't know what to do with it. You no longer use it. You have the nice flat screen now. But you got the old cathode tube thing. And, you know, I can't throw it in the trash. They tell me not to. So, it's in your garage. And it's just sitting there collecting dust, spider webs. And it's no longer being watched. If somebody was to turn it on, they go, oh, man. I just... It's set aside for use. Maybe you have an old toothbrush that, you know, you no longer, you bought a new one. But, you know, you haven't thrown away the old one because maybe I could use it for something. Maybe one day I'll, I'll scrub a cabinet with it or a floor with something. So I just leave it there and it just kind of gets old and just sets there and set aside. That's what it means to be cast aside. That it's no longer usable. It's no longer in use. It's set over. And Paul said, that's my biggest fear is for me to be put to a place where I used to be something. I used to be usable, but something happened and now I'm over here and I'm dried and I'm just a relic. He says, Paul says, I don't want that. Well, this applies to us because we don't want to be set aside. How is it that we could be usable in God's hands? How is it that if I want to be something that God can make, I want him to make me and I don't want to be just set on a shelf. So if you don't mind, as we go through here, we're going to look at four different things that are a part of this story and make the application here and that we want to see exactly what it is that God can do with a life that's surrendered to him, with a life that's still on that wheel in the hands of the master. The first thing I want to bring to your attention is the potter. The potter. We know here that the, the interpretation would be that God is the potter. He's the divine potter. In fact, hold your finger here. Maybe I'll just read it to you. It's up to you. Please don't lose your place. We're coming back. But in the book of Philippians, it gives a very encouraging promise. The book of Philippians chapter number 1. The book of Philippians chapter number 1 and verse number 6, it says, Being confident of this very thing, that he which hath begun a good work in you will perform it unto the day of Jesus Christ. So God gives us a promise here that he is the potter. And God wants to do something with the clay. And God says, I have begun a good work in you. And I'm going to continue against that day. What day? Until the day that Jesus Christ comes back. So what does that mean? Well, first of all, you have to be up on the wheel. Meaning that you've come to the place where you realize that 
you need salvation. That you were a sinner and because of your sin that you've offended a holy righteous God. And that because of that you deserved hell. But that Jesus died for you. And you came to the place where you personally asked Jesus to be your savior. Once you do that, you become what we call in religious terms saved. You are saved from your sins. You are saved from the penalty that God, that you owed God. When that happens, God then puts you on the potter's wheel. And God is going to begin to work on you. Now, he's the great potter. He already has something in mind what he wants to do with you. And what he has planned for you. God has for every single one of you, he has a plan. For every single one of you, God has a purpose. For every single one of you, he has a pattern that he wants for each vessel. God is the great potter. And he already has something in hand. And he's going to begin to do a work in you. And he's going to begin to work with you. Romans 8, 28, the second most famous Bible verse in the world that says, For we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, <laughs> to them who are the called according to his purpose. That he doesn't say everything that happens to you is good, but all things are going to work together for good. That he's working things together. He that began a good work in you. That here is the potter who has this clay and he has in mind to take that clay and to turn into a usable vessel. And God has in mind how to do that. He has in mind what he's going to do with it. He already has in mind what he's going to do with it when he's finished making it. He forms each one of us into a vessel as an individual vessel, as something he has a plan to. God knows what he's doing. In fact, God has you here for a reason. He God has saved you for a reason. God has put you here in this time for a reason. And God has put you in this service at this church this morning for a reason. He has a plan. He knows what he's doing. He wants to get something accomplished. He is a God who knows what he's doing. He is the potter. He's the one in charge. Now with that, as we also see the potter, there's something else that we see here. And that's the clay. That's the clay. Clay is common, ordinary stuff. There is no inherent beauty in clay. It's just there. In fact, the only thing that makes it beautiful or makes it usable, makes it valuable, is in whose hands it's in. For example, if we took something, just a big lump, nothing extraordinary about it, something that was just made, and God wants to do something with this lump. Now, of course, this is a little bit more special clay, but if you just took clay out of the ground, where I grew up in Texas, we had clay nearby. You could just take it from the ground and actually start playing with it and start working with it. And it just came from the ground. It's just ordinary stuff. But when we're surrendered to Jesus Christ and we're surrendered to God to allow him to do a work, what happens is that we are now in the potter's hands. And he is going to start to do something with it. But in order for that to happen, we have to be surrendered. Do you know that there is a different decision between salvation and being surrendered to God? And oftentimes there is a time period between those two decisions. That someone could get saved, but it may take them a while before they finally surrender to say, God, I want you to use me and make me. I want you to do something. Lord, I surrender to what you would have me to do. This is an important decision that, may I say, most Christians never make. They may be saved and going to heaven, but they've never surrendered to God. God, whatever you would have me to do. But as soon as you surrender, God then separates you from the common lump. And he begins to work. And that's where the value is. The value is in the potter's hands. Without it, that clay is just a lump. It's just there. Nothing of they, they could do of itself. It has to have the potter's hands. Whoever's hands it is makes it valuable. For example, if we had a baseball bat and we put it up on the ground, it's not worth a cent. It doesn't do anyone any good while it's on the ground. You could put the baseball bat in my hand and put me in a pro game and guess what? It's still not worth a cent. But you put it in the hand of someone 
who is very good. I don't know any baseball players now, so forgive me, I can't call anybody out. But you put it, that baseball bat in the hands of a good hitter, it's now worth a lot. It could win games. It could make a lot of money for the person using it. It is very valuable because of the hands that it is in. It's not valuable of what it, because of what it is. It's valuable because of whose hands it's in. When God, uh, when someone surrenders himself to God, God's hands are very valuable. And by the way, God is willing to take anyone and everyone. And if they're surrendered to God, he can make anyone and everyone a valuable vessel because of who God is. God could take a nobody and turn him into a somebody as long as that person's in God's hands. Now, in order to work with clay, it first has to be separated from the common lump. It has to be separated from the rest of the clay. That you can't work with a whole huge amount of clay. You can only work with a little bit of clay. And it has to be separated from the common lump. But then once you are separated, it just, you don't take something like this and just immediately turn it into a vessel. God doesn't immediately start working, but in order to start making this a vessel, you have to start working with it a little bit. For example, for this clay here, before I could do anything, I have to start pressing it, mashing it. I have to roll it up a little bit. I have to get it and start rolling and make it a big lines. You remember that? You guys remember this? We're doing kindergarten stuff today, right? First grade stuff. You remember that? You have to work on it in order to be a vessel. You have to stretch it out, pound it in together. You have to press on it, eat on it a little bit. You have to work with it. This is part of that thing to make it pliable, to make it usable in the hands of the master. The, the potter has to work on that clay. He has to work on it. If you take it from uh, the common lump from outside like I did in Texas, it had rocks and grass that had to be taken out. So when you work with it, you have to find the rocks and toss it out. You have to find the debris that's in it, the little blades of grass that are stuck into it. And you have to pull it out. And it takes time to work. It has to be clear of all foreign matter. All the things that get in the way of that vessel being usable. So many people get impatient while they're making, after they make that surrender to God. And they don't realize that there's a waiting period. People have something in mind like I did. I'm surrendered to God. So the next time I preach, guess what? The doors, we're not going to be able to contain it. We're going to have to have police out there to be able to direct all the traffic. That as soon as I'm surrendered to God, guess what? All of a sudden the windows of heaven are open. I just stand up and automatically magic happens. That's not how it works. People get surrendered to God and say, all right, God, I'm surrendered. And so immediately, I'm usable. Immediately, woohoo! the angels start chores. People look in and go, oh, I mean, immediately there's an impact, right? And it doesn't happen. In fact, what does happen is you get round up in a ball. You get pounded out a little bit. Start beating on it. You roll it up. And if this clay was to talk to me, it'd be like, what are you doing to me, man? I mean, you, you've been hitting on me. I mean, you've been poking at me. I mean, you flatten me out and then squish me together. What are you doing? And people ask that. They've surrendered to God. They're finally serious about this Christianity thing. And then next thing you know, they're going, God, what are you doing to me? I mean, you're pounding on me all the time. I feel like you flattened me out. and I, 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 What's going on? And but God, you, you, you take everything and you just roll it up. And I was doing... Uh, and people are, don't understand. There's a process. In order for the clay to be usable, the master, before he even works on the vessel, he has to work on the clay. Until the clay is at a place where it could be molded. 
at a place where the clay will do what the potter wants it to do. And this is part of that process. And may I say this is the process where many of the people in our church are at right now. That you finally surrendered. God, I, I'm tired of playing around. I really want to be used. Lord, I, I want you to do something with me. And God says, I've been waiting for this. And he takes you out, puts you up on the lump, up, up on the thing, and you're separated out. You said, but all my friends were there. All, all the things that I liked were there. The things I liked to do was over there. And God says, you got to be separate. I got to keep you by yourself. I got to work with you. And then he starts getting the rocks out. The things out of your life that are, would keep you. I mean, you don't want to have a vessel that has rocks in it. You don't want to have a coffee cup that has gravel on in it. Those things have to be separated out. They have to be dug out. They have to be found. Sometimes when you work with clay, you don't see them right away until you flatten it out. And then you find those rough spots. You find the spots that are hard, that won't be malleable. And those spots have to be removed. And then the clay has to be molded again and worked on. And the same time, the person's like, I don't know what's going on. I thought things would be easier now that I'm surrendered. I thought things would be better. But now it seems like things are getting worse and complicated. And what's going on? And God's working the whole time. The potter knows what he's doing. The master knows what he needs to do to make that clay usable. And he works on it. And if that clay gets off the wheel now, it will never be made into what it could have been. If it says, forget it, this is too hard. It's too complicated. I don't like it. And says, I, then it's cast away. No longer usable. Because this is the process. That we have the potter and we also have the clay that has to be usable. Before it could even be made, it has to be plied with. It has to be mashed. It has to be flattened. It has to be rolled up. It has to be manipulated. It has to be passed over, over and over before anything can be made out of it. Then after that, we have the vessel. The vessel. So we start with the potter. And then we have the clay. Then we have the vessel. Do you know the outside of a vessel could be made very easily? I mean, that's what we watch on the potter's wheel. And you watch as the people take their hands and the clay is made on the outside. But do you know what's really hard to make? The inside. The inside of the vessel is what's really valuable. That's what you're going to put your liquid into, your containers into. But that's the hardest part to make. The inside of it is what makes it valuable. And if the inside is not made right, the whole thing is useless. You know, it's the inside of us that's the hardest to make. I meant anyone could convert the outside. I meant you think about standards. You think about Mormons or Catholic nuns. I meant they dress right. They look right. They sound right. But does it mean that the inside is right? I meant we, anybody could work on the outside. But God's working on the inside. And if the inside's right, the outside will reflect it. You know, we have inside stuff like bitterness that has to be taken care of, that has to be scooped out. Things of jealousy, envy, bad temper. Those things have to be scooped out. Faithlessness, pride. God does so much as he works on the vessel. He has to take the time, not just to work on the outside, but he has to work on the inside. So many times people get stuck on the outside. And they'll get to the place where they're looking at others. Well, you're not dressed right. We know people that will say, 
almost take a tape measure and try to measure people's skirts to see how long they are. Or they'll try to measure people's hair to see if it's within regs. Or they'll start looking on the outside. And they do that because they're not spiritual themselves. And it proves because their inside's wrong. They're looking at everyone else judging the outside of everyone else. And it's their inside that needs to be fixed. Their inside, not the other person. Mind your own business, as a friend of mine said. You just let God deal with you. Let Amen. God let others deal with their other issues. You have enough problems for yourself as God works with you. Tries to get you in the habits. Getting some of those other things out. It's the inside of the vessel that takes the most work. But when the inside is right, it what makes that vessel valuable. God works on that vessel. So we have the potter who's working and orchestrating. He knows what he wants to do with the clay. He takes the clay, separates it from the common lump, and he begins to manipulate it and work with it. Before he could even make it a vessel, he has to make it pliable, get this stuff out of the system, get the things out, get it so it will move and work the way that it should. And then when he starts making the vessel, sure, he'll try to make the outside, but it's the inside that takes the most work. It's the inside that has to be right. It's the insight that has to be made correctly in order for it to be valuable. But you know, there's one more thing here that we have to pay attention to. And that's the wheel. That's the wheel, the potter's wheel. You know, if they looked underneath the potter's wheel, the old-fashioned potter's wheel, they would see that it would have a trindle. And on this trindle, you would have the foot of the potter. And that determines which way it turns and how fast it turns. The wheel is the circumstances of life. God's the one who controls the circumstances of life. He's the one who operates the wheel. And the op wheel operates for one purpose. The perfection of the vessel. There are times that the potter makes the wheel go faster. The potter has a plan for that. There are times that it needs to go slower. There's a purpose for that. There are times that it needs to stop. There's a purpose for that. The potter is thinking of just one thing. The perfection of the vessel. There is no wasted or useless motion in the potter's hands. Because he knows what he's doing. We have a principle in the Bible called treasures of darkness. That principle is that the worst things that happen to us could turn to be the greatest things that happen to us if it makes us closer to the Lord Jesus Christ. If it gets accomplished His purpose. And so there are times that it may be something that seems really awful, but God was in control of that. And God used that to help make the vessel what it needed to be made. God knew what He was doing. God's in control of the circumstance. So we looked at the four things that were there. And we had the potter. We had the clay. We had him making the vessel. We also witnessed this wheel, the circumstances. But there's one more thing. It's so much a, th a thing as an event that occurred. Notice with me again in verse number four. Verse number three, and I went down to the potter's house and behold, he, the potter, wrought a work, the vessel on the wheels. And the vessel that he made of clay was marred in the hands of the potter. This word marred carries the idea of ruined. Notice the word there. It was not marred by the hand. It was marred in the hand. What happens with the marring? Well, what happens with the marring is that <laughs> there's a hard spot. There's something that's inside of that vessel. And so as they're making the vessel, it hits that hard spot. It hits it. And then the vessel collapse, collapses on itself. But notice it said that the pottery, the, um, the vessel was marred in the hand of the potter. It wasn't marred by the hand. Meaning that it wasn't the potter who ruined it. It wasn't the potter who caused it to collapse. But it was 
in his hand. Why is that a big deal? Because if it wasn't in his hand, if it wasn't in his control, that pot, pottery vessel would fly off the wheel Amen. once it hit that spot. The potter held it close even though it was marred. Even though it was marred, he still had a good hand on it, so it wasn't lost. That marring comes because there was a hard spot, something in that clay that wasn't moldable, that was in there. The eye might not have seen it, but the hand had spotted it. The father's fingers felt it and knew where it was at and knew it needed to be taken care of. And the potter kept holding pressure on the clay until it yielded. And if it marred, then the potter took it and made the vessel up again. He had a plan. He knew what he was doing the whole time. He was able to do it. D.L. Moody, an evangelist of yesteryear, said, It is amazing what a potter can do with a broken vessel. Provided that he gets all the broken pieces, stay on the wheel. Stay on the wheel. Now again, this is a different decision than salvation. Salvation is coming to the place where you realize that you're a sinner and because of your sin that you've offended a holy righteous God and that you deserve an awful place called hell to be separated from him. But Jesus died to pay that price for you and you personally accept him to be your savior. What we're speaking about is something different altogether. This is a surrender when someone comes to the place that says, Lord, I'm taking this life seriously. I want you to use me. Whatever you see fit, I surrender myself to you. Then when you do that, God separates you from that common lump. And he begins to work on you. He gets those hard spots out. He gets those foreign debris out of the system. He works with you. And by the way, there is a period here. It's not an instant vessel. There is a process. And that process will go on until all the foreign things are out. And until that clay is moldable. So as long as there's spots that that clay won't get rid of, he can't start making that vessel. That clay has to be moldable. And then he'll begin to work on that vessel. And everything that the potter's doing is for that vessel's perfection. For that vessel's use. Stay on the wheel. Stay on the wheel. We know many of you in here have been expressing an, in, an interest of being used of God. Lord, I want you to use me. I want you to do something with me. I want you to make me into something. God says, okay, I've been waiting for you. We know that there's some people who haven't made that decision yet. Maybe you need to make that decision. Lord, I want to be usable. But we want to let you know what's going on. Many of you, and it's a normal thing. Lord, I surrendered. Why am I going through this? Why are you pounding on me? Why? I just... What's going on? This is what's going on. It is the necessary process of making the vessel to make you usable. To make you pliable. Stay on the wheel. For those of you who want to be used of God, and you know this process, I've seen many of you now nodding your heads, understanding what's going on. This is what's going on. The potter knows what he's doing. Stay on the wheel. Allow him to do his work. In fact, surrender even more. Lord, do whatever you need to do with me. Be thorough with me. Be complete with me. Do whatever you have to do to make me the person you want me to be. Surrender yourself more. And God is able to make a vessel, amazing vessel from you that will be usable for many, many years. Hopefully never even cast away. As long as you stay pliable. As, you, as long as you stay usable. God will use you. So dear friend. First of all. 
Do you know for sure that you're forgiven of your sins? If you were to die today, would you know for sure that you're going to heaven? If not, dear friend, let me tell you the good news is, is that we could take a Bible and we could show you from God's word how you could know without a doubt that heaven's your home. Second of all, are you surrendered? It is a different decision. There are many Christians, in fact, most Christians, never make a decision to be used by God. They're glad to show up at church. They're glad to check off some boxes. They're glad just to be there. But they have no desire to really be used of God. Maybe you need to search your heart and say, God, do I want to be usable? Maybe you need to surrender and say, Lord, I'm willing to be used. And then those of you who are now in the process of being made, stay on the wheel. Stay on the wheel. Don't give up. Let God do His work. Let Him get that stuff out. Let Him make you usable. He knows what He's doing. He knows what He's feeling for. He knows what He has in mind. Let Him do His work. And let Him be the vessel. Make you the vessel that He wants you to be. Thank you for listening to this audio message. This is Pastor Scotty Bockhaus, and I encourage you to take this information that you just received and make a specific decision to follow after the Lord. If you don't know Jesus Christ as your Savior, let me beg you to take the time to receive Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. If you are saved, I encourage you to make a decision in your life to help you get closer with the Lord. If there's anything specific we can do to be a blessing or to pray for you, we encourage you. Look us up on the internet at riverviewbc.com. Once again, that's riverviewbc.com. Or if you would prefer to call us, you can give us a call at area code 920 530-6308. Once again, that number is 920-530-6308. If there's anything we can do to be a blessing or an encouragement to you, please let us know. We would love to make ourselves available. Thank you.